מנהל קבוצת הארכיטקטים, למי שלא מכיר. כדי שלא נעביר את זה לי כמה פעמים שתרימו את היד, אז מי כאן מקבוצת הארכיטקטים בדרך כלל? ומי כאן מהקבוצה של סי-שאר בדרך כלל? מי בי? שתיהם? לא. ג'קי, תרים את היד. תודה לכולכם שבאתם, העברנו את הכנס לכאן היום מטעמי גודל וגם מטעמי נוחות. היום אין משובים, ככה שאתם לא צריכים למלא שום דבר. לכן גם אתם לא מקבלים שום פרס במתנה היום. מי שרוצה מוזמן ללכת, יש עוד קצת אוכל בחוץ. אבל אם באתם לשמוע הרצאה טובה, אני מאמין שזה מה שתשמעו. כרגיל אני מבקש, אתם מוזמנים כן לשלוח משובים אליי באימייל, בקשות, רעיונות שקיבלתם בעקבות ההרצאה הזאת לעוד נושאים, כל דבר שעולה על כולכם. וזהו, תודה שבאתם, עכשיו אני אתן כמה מילים באנגלית. פיניש טוב מהגיבונה. אהו. לא. session uh, which uh, you know with uh, two formidable user groups um, this is great this is great for user group show right I love it uh, the fact that this is a combined session is actually my fault uh, or was sort of my suggestion because I said I got two inquiries and I said uh -uh, can't do it to the C sharp people C++ to C sharp people I can't do it because you know, the time is already taken by the architect and I said just talk talk about each other properly you can both come. And then they made, made it work, and now we have uh, this wonderful, wonderful uh, combination of C-sharp programmers, C++ C-sharp programmers, and the architect. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a architecture talk in C-sharp. Excellent. Okay? So that's, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend, I have zero slides. I was thinking about making it, making some. Then I thought, well, there's going to be I have had enough PowerPoints already, so I'm going to use a formal language to explain uh, a few things to you. Um, one thing I'd like to say, which I didn't say in the course today because it wasn't really relevant, I may mention it to the others in the course. Tomorrow is uh, in, the, in the interest of uh, sort of full disclosure, I have a little bit of a surprise that I make known yesterday. Jackie already knows him, he asked me, just asked me. Is the NDA information? I said, oh, well, no, really it's not, but I haven't been public with it. Um, I'll be leaving you all. This is the last time I'm going to be in Israel, as in my current role. Um, from February 1st, 2006, I'm going to be a program manager uh, in, for the Windows Communication Foundation for Microsoft. Um, and my job is going to be, um, for the first time at least, um, so that I can learn how things work inside Microsoft, which is a different thing, right? Especially in a team that's as strong and as blessed with smart people as uh, the Windows Communication Foundation, Indigo is, where I'm just a very little light. Um, so to learn how all those things work, how to deal with all those alpha people, um, they created me a nice job which actually lets me interface with you all, uh, because I'm going to be uh, responsible for the community, meaning um, I take your ideas, I want to see your samples, I want to see what you built with Indigo, I want to make you famous if you're doing good stuff, 
and uh, I would I want to take whatever input you have, whether you hate it or love it, um, back into the team so they can make the product better for you. If you think that you need more extensibility points to build your stuff, uh, I'm the guy to I will be the guy to ask. Uh, that is valid as of February 1st. Until then, um, I'm with Achim here for my firm, for, for our firm, for intelligence. Um, and uh, Achim is gonna, is gonna take care of my baby afterwards. So, after that, which is sort of a, sort of a big thing uh, for me, after being sort of out and, out and about and speaking and talking and being the you know, intelligence uh, for four years, now it's switching to the builder side of the side of things. It's a big thing. Um, and I'm a little nervous about it. Right? I'm a loud guy, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably well known, uh, but then to actually switch onto the inside, that's a thing that's, for me that's a big thing. And, and eventually I have to move to America too, next year, which is also a big thing, right? What am I going to do with my football? <laughs> no, no, well, I'm going to teach you. <laughs> what I've written, what I've written, an, an application that I unfortunately can't show you today, but which, uh, about which you can read on my blog increasingly more probably, is uh, I'm using an application called Beyond TV, which uh, is capable of streaming media, uh, streaming live TV uh, through internet connections, and I built a plugin for Media Player, and I built a plugin for Media Center. Um, so I can actually watch live German TV, football included, anywhere where I am. And so uh, once I have this application written, or at least a proof of concept written, that I can actually do this, I was happy to sign with Microsoft. Before that, impossible, because no football, no, no working in the US. That's as simple as this. All right, on to the topic. There is a lot of confusion in architect lands and in programmer lands, and how to make two programs talk to each other. There's a bunch of options, right? You have remoting, you have enterprise services, you have web services, you have MSMQ. There's MSMQ man. And you should you should create a shirt like Superman like or Batman like with MSMQ on it. Because you're, you're, you are supporting one of the coolest technologies in the Windows platform that the fewest people know something about. <laughs> which, is, which is a pity. Right? MSMQ is, is a great tool and all you think is, you know, it's a message queue, it's disk based, hence it's slow. It's going to blow away a lot of the other things. It's faster than you think. Right? MSMQ can transmit something in the order of five to 7,000 messages per second. It's, it's a quick thing. It's a very cool, it's a very, very cool technology. So we have remoting, let's, 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 let's recap. Remoting, enterprise services, web services, MSMQ. When do I use what? And can I write an application that integrates all of those technologies which are different and then make that application actually work with Indigo too? with the new stuff. How do we build this? It turns out that after a little bit of thinking, I got to a point that I have actually figured out that it's not so hard to build, oops, to build an application or to find an application pattern. This is just, you know, shorter for the architects. I found a pattern. <laughs> you should now be happy. I'm actually sure, I'm gonna use a factory pattern. So cool. Um, I found a pattern how to integrate all those things and to make it all wonderfully service oriented. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a little address management, address management application. I'm going, to, I'm going to explain to you what I'm doing. I'm going to do this writing a class library and I also will, will uh, write a little web service. So I'm going to be, have a callable web service for it and also build a little bit of a client. So I'm going to show you a bunch of patterns and, and ways how to align your code, how to structure your code so it's usable with any of those technologies. And you can basically pick and choose based on your communication path. And then we're going to talk about the communication path and where 
the respective technologies are, are um, good. Okay? So let's start. Um, I'm going to create a class library address manager. And uh, in the interest of uh, proper structure, so here I have class woman, right? Which I'm going to throw away. Okay, and now I'm going to create two folders first. One is called contract, one is called data. Uh, folders in Visual Studio, in the Visual Studio Pro uh, Solution Explorer, do two things. First of all, they create a directory, not surprisingly. Second, they create a sub namespace. So there's, there's um, a, the default namespace here is address manager, same as the project. I can rename it, but this creates a sub namespace. Into the data namespace, I'm creating a little class. Now, I could use the fancy designers. I don't, because they slow me down. So the programmers laugh. The architects are shocked. <laughs> I'm not going to use I'm not going to use inheritance or any of that. Uh, I'm just simply going to define a postal address. That's that's what I'm managing. Okay. So um, I need to have uh, a few field, string fields, right? So I'm going to do a um, string. I'm going to do a um, city. I'm going to do a um, Postal code. I'm going to do a city, uh, a country. I'm going to do a address info, additional info line. Mm, and I'm going to create an Let's make this a name. Let's make it easy. Okay? Is that sort of all we need? Sort of. Okay. So let's create a few uh, parameter accessors for this. Uh, they should be, of course, they should be in caps, so that too. I'm not selling you the tool, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying the name, I'm just since since this should be this, since since this should be really as enjoyable for me as it's for you, I'm just using it to uh, to uh, you know make my life a little easier. Say the name. Oh, should I? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is Code Rush that I'm using. Now I'm using Ghost Dog. Code Rush is a tool that's made by Developer Express that actually costs money, but. Um, it is a, it's a fairly cool tool. GhostDoc uh, is a tool that I just used to create the, the documentation pieces. It right? gets a set the street and the street. That's GhostDoc basically uses a pattern, a little pattern thing. It also can document methods. If you name the methods right, um, it will just create a meaningful little description, which doesn't tell you much more than the actual method name. But if you have a check-in policy, it says, there's got to be documentation on it. Go talk <laughs> elsewhere. The architects wish to thank you for helping us making code more documents. <laughs> exactly. So, here I, so, uh, and Code Rush is the tool that I'm using. So, so Code Rush is, um, has a little more of the capabilities that Visual Studio 2.0 has. Visual Studio has, what well, Visual Studio has, it has templates. So, it has, for instance, prop. That's a Visual Studio thing. So you see the little prop thing here, and I say tab, and it gives me the data type, and synchronizes that up, and it, I have the local variable, foo, and I kind of rename that. So that's the built-in built capability of Visual Studio per se. These are so-called uh, templates, and you can use them yourself, code snippets, basically, which are templatized. And uh, Code Rush, which is a tool that I also use with, with, uh, with 2003, and uh, I got used to, if I want to define a string property, I say ps space, and then here I have it, and then I could say foo, and it just synchronizes the whole thing up. 
um, if I want to create a, uh, a void method, I say mv and it does that. Um, if I say, if I want in, in, that, in that method, now I jump sort of to the marker, I do it for each loop fe, and then I'm here where I can go and I want to have a for loop space, and then I have the limit and all those things. And I, it can also, there's also an additional, an additional plugin that I have, it's called Refactor Pro. Um, and that uh, Refactor tool um, is something that I may be using also. Um, Code Rush is so good, in, in my personal point of view, that I would, I would buy, if, if I wouldn't be getting this for free, so much in the interest of general disclosure, I'm an MVP. Every MVP can get it for free from, from DevExpress, right? And every RD too, but there's only two of us in the room. Do we have another RD? No, you're the, you're the RD for as well, right? That's as much budget, budget as they have here. Um, so, so uh, uh, as an MVP, you can get it, and I think the single user license is $250. Uh, it's worth a personal investment. It's that good. It is absolutely cool. And you can define your own templates and all the, the, the synchronization stuff and all of that is, is brilliant. It's really, and the guy who's programming this, Mark Miller, is a madman. He is really good. Okay, now I have, now I have an address, okay? I want to make it very simple and let's make an, a service-like thing that lets us manage addresses, okay? So, first thing I'm going to do, oh, how do I identify this address? Now I forgot that, right? Um, we're going to make a private I was waiting for that. <laughs> Are we going to make it a GUI? No, no. Why not? What's wrong about the GUI? Is it bad? No, a string happens to be pretty universal for that. So let's make it a string. Is it okay with the architect? Fine. So here's my address ID. Now I have an identifiable thing. So let's go and let's create a little <coughs> interface. Button. I'm a calm guy. I love interface. I have to correct it. I'm an Indigo guy, and therefore I love interfaces. <laughs> so I address manager. What do we need? We need. Let's make this void. Let, let's make those things void first. <coughs> I need um, create address, and I'm simply going to pass the address. And now I can't get the address because it's sitting in a different namespace. Intentionally, I should say. Okay, that's create address. That's okay. Um, I should probably, since the address ID, I can't set it. I could create it. I could create a create data special structure which doesn't allow me to set the ID. Instead, I will mandate that, and that's by convention, that the the ID shall not be set. And if it's set, then it's going to be ignored. And I'm going to return the newly created ID. So I'm going to let the source def define the ID. I'm going to return that as the single as the single return value here. Um, then I'm going to say, um, of course, delete address. And the address ID should be enough for that. And uh, I'm going to say uh, get address. See, there's no magic in typing parameters. Um, and um, I'm going to return an address array with find address. And I'm going to pass an address as a data, as a, file, as a search template um, criteria. Uh, and I need to update it. Hmm. We're doing an upsert. 
Okay, so instead of creating the, uh, creating the address this way, I'm going to say create update address. Okay, so I'm, I'm using one, one method for this, but because in our reality, I would probably be backing this with exactly one sort of procedure in the back. Uh, or at least it's, it's closely related. Right? I'm going to just, if, if I can't find it, I'm going to update it, otherwise I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to create it. That's, that's my choosing. I just make one. Yeah, that's coming. Sorry, I I had all intent to make the name of this. See, that's why it's named that. Was thank you for for a moment. Um, I you know what? So that we have a little stuff to work with, I'm going to say void update numbers. Are you bored already? <laughs> Uh, there is a little bit broken, there's a tiny little bit broken with this interface. The problem is that if get address, for instance, would need an, an additional parameter for whatever reason. Or I would, for, let's, let's say find address. Here I have, now I have, I'm passing in an address as criteria, however, what I'm not specifying is, is how, how I want to execute that, that mode. Do I want to do a wildcard match? Uh, do I want to match all or any? There's all sorts of different things. So I could actually have a, a sort of defined mode, right? Now, I'm adding, with that, I'm requiring that I'm adding a parameter, meaning everybody who has already programmed to this, uh, to this signature here has to recompile their code. Even though I could, I could have an optional parameter, I may, could make that an optional parameter and say, you know, if that's zero, then we have a default behavior that's just like it like was. And then if it's one or two or three or the respective enum value, then we're going to behave a little differently. Uh, with, with parameter lists, that's difficult to do. With VB, VB supports optional parameters. They hear Jackie be happy. <laughs> VB supports optional parameters, and that means um, you know, with VB it would it would work. With C sharp it doesn't. How do we get around? How do we do optional parameters? Right. Overloads. That's right. We're not going to do that. Overloads are object thing. I'm a services guy. We're going to create messages. Now, the architects are going to be happy. The C, the C people are going to say, I'm nuts. That's a lot of work. It's actually so ugly <laughs> that I want to hide it later. <laughs> Public uproar. Another trick. That was C space. Is that cool? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Boy, it's that bad. I'm serious. Private data address public. Huh? <coughs> I saw that. I'm creating a data structure instead of passing a parameter list. I'm creating a message. Uh, more precisely, I'm creating a message body. The reason why I'm doing this is I can add arbitrary number of additional parameters, optional parameters to the structure and pass them on, which I can't do in with parameter list. This works well with flexible serialization technologies such as web services and if you use the XML formatter, 
It also works well with MSMQ. It has some problems with remoting, it has some problems with, with enterprise services, admit it, but it's a general strategy, general pattern, and using messages is a good thing, and uh, since we're using, since we're creating a service, that's a good, that's a good thing to do. Um, <clears throat> since we're gonna be, so of course we are returning a string, right? So there's gotta be a response to this. The room gets dark when I mark stuff. That's awesome power. <laughs> Here's my response. And this response has uh, the address ID, which is private. <laughs> okay. I'm going to leave the others as they are for the time being, right? Because you don't need to see me typing up all those classes. So we're going to park them for a while. Okay, let's deal with create adders first. So we have a create adders response, which is going to give us the ability to return more than one value. Right now we're returning one, but we may feel like we want to return two in the future. And this sort of indirection gives you the capability. We're just formalizing is this is this architects listen. This is a pattern. Okay, the pattern is every method on every outward facing network communication interface has one input parameter and at most one output parameter. Period, and that's a data structure. Since this thing is outward facing, potentially, we have to do a few things to make that thing compatible with the rest of the world. So, for that, I'm adding, I could add that to the properties, but I'm adding this to, uh, I'm just adding a little class here for a few definitions. And I'm gonna call this service, the service metadata class. It's simply sitting here. The service metadata class is a class that's internal, so that's fine. What do we have here? I'm going to say public const string um, address manager uh, namespace URI. I'm going to make that HTTP schemas new intelligence.com slash 2005 slash 12 slash demo slash address manager. Okay, that's my first namespace URI. You'll see why I'm doing that in a separate class. And that's the address data namespace URI because I'm separating I'm separating between the service and the data. Because the data, the data Definitions are generally useful, right? They can be used inside of a service or by someone else. So I separate that schema from the schema for my for the service that I'm doing. So the messages really are bound to that interface, while the address class really isn't. The address class is a universal data type that I'm going to express in some way in schema. So I'm going to give that its own namespace. See, sometimes it's a little too, it's, the tools try to be a little too bright for their own good. Okay? So I have the service metadata, and it's just a class that contains some constant strings and all the additional metadata that I need because I need to mark some things up. This interface will stay as it is for the moment, but the classes I may, might use with remoting. I might use them with ASP.NET, I might do some with enterprise services, so they have to have some capabilities. First capability is they gotta be serializable. That's for enterprise services and for remoting. Second capability is they should be usable with, and of course the address, right, that I'm using here, don't never forget, should be serializable as well. The next thing is that I want to make this um, Member of this, the declaration, 
member of the surface schema. And what I want to do is I want to declare this as a complex type in schema. And I want to declare this as a root element in schema. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say XML type. And that's an attribute. And this attribute is not defined in, um, in the scope that I have right now. Built in Cake Builder Visual Studio 2005, that's a loaded plugin, is you go and say resolve. And it actually figures this out and adds the using directive for you, which is a very cool thing. I, I've, since I've discovered this feature, I don't think I've ever written a using statement yet. I just use that. Namespace equals, and now comes the reason why I'm using a centralized class, centralized location for my strings, for my namespace strings, because I'm pulling them from there. So um, this is now service metadata dot, and that's my uh, address manager namespace URI. That's my namespace for the XML type, and uh, to make it a root element, I'm going to say XML root. And I can take this stuff here and apply that to the request as well. Here we go. And here's my data. And the data, of course, gets that, but the different namespace URI because it's a different thing, right? It's the data. So with that, I should be able to Ah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Thank you for the hint, anyways. So now I've compiled my first set of declarations. Let's go and look at it very quick. And looking at it, we'll do with. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> see, the thing is, it hurts your eyes, but it makes you look. Uh, it makes you see it better. There's always a trade-off. This is much better then, uh, oh, there's very many directories. How did I call this? G, there you go. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, and it's, uh, and it's, uh. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I find the right one. Uh, of course, this path is way too long, so I'm going to uh, make this that. Okay, now we're looking, going to look at the directory. <laughs> Dude, I always get, I always, whenever I do this prompt trick, I always get into that mode. <sighs> the innocent are puzzled. <laughs> Whoever didn't know what this is all about, right? <laughs> raise your hand, Chris. No, no, you don't need to raise your hand, right? Get get a, a Gen 2 Linux or whatever Linux uh, bootable CD or Nopix, right? A bootable CD, and then try to get a listing, a directory listing out of command prompt. LS minus L is a good idea. Minus L A even better. All of that. Okay, so. Um, I'm using XSD, which is the schema generation tool, and I'm going to throw uh, the address manager DLL at it, and I'm going to look what it does. It will spit out two schemas. Uh, schema zero, zero, uh, schema ones. Schema zero will have uh, <laughs> it knows about the prompt, huh? Right? My notepad is broken. Which means now I really need to format the product. Because I can't live without a without notepad. Alright, let's try it this way. Ah. That was that was that was so wrong. <laughs> A mouse challenged. So here are my schemas. Um, the first schema contains, rightfully contains the address. Um, wait, this is now called view code. Yes, so this was called view XML, now it's called view code. 
That's as far that's as far as we've come. This contains the address. This is the schema version. That's con that's a complex type. So here's my. This is the XML root equivalent. That's the XML type equivalent. As you can see, there's a sequence in there, and here we have our uh, elements. Now, the thing is, all these are minicurs zero, which is what the default is for uh, the, X, the XML serializer. How, however, I would like to make a distinction very clearly between uh, it's not there, right? It's unknown, so to speak, and it's null, and there's a value present. I would like to make that, that distinction explicitly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to decorate all the addresses, all the address properties, everything that's visible to the XML serializer, I want to decorate them with attributes that state that. So I'm going to say XML element and say is nullable equals true. So now they're nullable and now I'm going to go and decorate them all. And this serves another purpose as well, which I'm going to disclose to you in a little bit. Okay, so now they're nullable, let's do that stump again. It's reloading it, it's reloading it, and the that view here. Now they're all one, but they're nullable. Nullable equals true, so they must occur. Actually, the secret is the XML serializer doesn't care whether they occur or not, right? It just it's just a it's just a formal way to let us do something else. To make this thing versionable, right? I'm not going to go into all details of the versionability of that. Uh, to make to make it versionable, we need to append something here. We need to say, you know what? We're going to take this sequence, and anything that follows is okay too. We're, gonna, we're just going to accept it. We're going to throw it back, and uh, so make make things a little more flexible. So we want to accept any other XML content that occurs here as well. That's best practice. That's how we do things. I could elaborate for an hour why that's good. Just accept it as that's a good thing. It's open content, open content element, X, X, XSL, any. I want to put this here, so this is how it should look, XS, any, so, so that anything can follow here. That's a declaration. To add this declaration, and actually add space, in this data structure, they can actually take this any content, I need to add something. And what I'm going to add is a pattern. So I'm just going to put this here. I'm actually going to put this into another region. Because that's one thing that you only need to write once and can paste into any sort of uh, structure that you want to XML serialize. And it looks like this. You do a private, X, uh, you do a private XML element. And what I mean with that is, in fact, the system XML element. That's called any. That's exposed using a property that's called any, which gets an, an attribute called XML any, any element. Okay? To make this complete, we're going to have a private XML attribute that has that's called any attributes. And of course, I'm doing it all wrong because these need to be erased. Instead of refactoring the whole thing, I'm just going to do it again. And that's the right as well. And that is XML any attributes. And what this what this is is basically a placeholder that's going to be generated into the schema. Okay, there it is. Placeholder, it's going to be generated into the schema. And whenever an excess data comes in, excess attributes or excess elements, so stuff maybe that a future version knows, but the current version doesn't know about, all those additional elements go into, X, into this any element. So let's say you get this data structure to work on, and then you push this data structure back, you do an update, you get, and then you do an update. The additional data that your, your, your your version, your higher version server already knows about, is simply going to pump this back to the server 
So you do a proper update, you don't lose any data on the way. That's why this is really useful. And it makes your, it makes your application more flexible towards, you know, it's not a narrowly defined thing, it's just you have, you have like an ellipsis in the data structure, if you like. Okay, so that's what we have here. Now, the catch is that if we want to use this in a flexible way, this is an XML capability, right? This, flex, this sort of flexibility doesn't work with enterprise services or remoting because they can't deal with arbitrary, uh, arbitrary XML data in that way. And it turns out that XML attributes and XML elements aren't serializable. So to make sure that this, this data structure will actually serialize, we need to exclude those extensibility pieces from remoting from enterprise services, as sad as, it's, as sad as it is. So I'm going to make those puppies here non-serialized. So to make remoting and enterprise services not compliant. This is specifically a so, and I can simply collapse this, take it, copy it, and since I've done that, I can now go and take any additional data structure that I that I please and simply outfit that if it works. That is, it should. Ah, yeah. Uh, outfit any additional data structure with the respective extensibility element because this extensibility requirement applies to pretty much every class that you send through an XML web service. So that's definitely a good thing to use. Classes are, now we have our classes serializable, we have them fit for, to be used with web services. Uh, and to be used with MSMQ, because with MSMQ we're going to use the XML formatting capabilities of the .NET framework. So that's already a wonderful thing. Now let's think about the implementation of the create method. Of course I'm going to create a fake method, it's not going to do anything. But let's think about how to implement that respective contract. Um, I'm going to go into my class, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to create an implementation class first. I'm going to say, fine, um, let's make a address manager and just to disambiguate things. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm not going to call it ES or remoting or anything, I'm just going to call it impl, okay? Even though that's a horrible name, right? Just for demonstration purposes, I'm using impl for implementation. Now, the implementation that I'm using will inherit from the contract space the I address manager. I'm going to implement the uh, respective stub. That's built in capability of Visual Studio. No panic. You don't have to pay $250 to get that. Um, it's pretty explicit about this. Of course, I can strip off this contract thing, and I can actually strip off here this contract thing. Now, of course, if I would be smart, I could actually include the namespace, but just to make it clear what I'm doing here, uh, I just leave it there. I would usually actually do the import. And uh, different to any real application, in this case here, implementation really doesn't matter. So, so we're simply going to create a return, a new response, and that's all we're going to do. So we're not going to do, going to worry too much about the Rating it. So up until this point, it's just, it's just a plain old normal class, base base class. What would we have to do to make this a remoting server class? Lifecycle management. Yeah. Well, we need to make a marshmallow ref object, right? So we're going to make it a Marshmallow Ref object. That's the first thing. Um, and then we're going to, if you say lifecycle management, that's fine. If you say so, happy. It doesn't do lifecycle management. This thing is going to live forever. Okay? Goodness. That's the remoting fitness of it. 
until I follow that path, right, we're going to do something else. I'm going to create one of those dreaded Okay, how do I get out of this code? Now you can teach me something. I need an RD to fix this. Now in the single project view of the solution explorer, how do I get the solution node? Add and, and, and a dummy project. Huh? Add a dummy project. Just add another project. Okay, so you resource settings is working for you as well. Is that the solution? Well, that's, that's what, exactly what I do. I, I did this one because I was sitting here like, where's my solution though? Yeah. And it's not there. And when you go and say tools, uh, import, export, set it. To reset your settings, you need to import and export them. Right. <laughs> That's a very, very smart thing. Reset all settings means I'm going to throw everything away that I've customized for myself. And I'm going to say C sharp. <laughs> There's my solution though. Uh -huh. there, there is some option in the settings. I, I think there's also some bug in there. <laughs> because I'm, sh I'm sure I haven't set this option. Especially because, well, who cares? So now I'm going to add to this thing a new website. A website. I want to I want to write an ASP on ASP on web service, right? So let's add a new website and let's make this a file system website. And I'm going to go. Hmm? Well, no, I can add what I want. Let's add a web service. Presentations, uh, uh, just proper order so I can find it. Okay, we call this address manager WS. The purpose of the web service is uh, to basically just hook it up, to basically hook it up. Um, I'm going to show all files. Here we go. Oh, that's dealt with the properties. Ah, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's, of course, it's bogus, right? ASP.NET 2.0 keeps surprising me. That, that's where the code is. The SMX file stays, the service CS goes away. Bye bye. I don't need the service implementation because I already have it. Here's my SMX file. Right? It says code behind, blah, 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 code behind, we get trash. Not really necessary. Because we already have a thing. And that thing is called, we have an address manager implementation. Actually, see, the one thing that we lost is a proper font. So let's restore that. 14, Consolas. Consolas is a wonderful Vista font that you could copy down from your list of copies. It's great. It's optimized for clear type. It's the best coding font in the world. So here's my ASMX file. Uh, it's just, you know, as a plain old class, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, look, um, actually, let's go and make a reference to the address manager. So to the other project. Let's, let's forget completely about this whole business of code behind and all those things and just let let us embed, let us reference this, this class right away. So browse, project, address manager, okay. And of course now it's the address manager dot address manager impl comma from address manager. All right? So we're gonna now we're gonna look at the uh, at the web service in the browser. <coughs> Let's see whether that does anything meaningful. And we'll come up with a warning saying 
can load it. And why is that so? Because it could be compiled. Let's try that again. That's good. It doesn't conform to basic profile because there's no endpoints, but apparently load the class. Mind that it's a Marshall Bar Wrap object, right? Because that works. Also, there's no web methods on that class, which of course help, doesn't help the cause here. Turns out, ASP.NET 2.0 web services have a wonderful feature, which I dearly love, which means that we don't really have to put any uh, web method attributes here. In fact, we can put them on the contract where they belong. So he said, and I'm not worried at all because I'm, I'm, I'm forcing a service-oriented design style upon remoting and upon enterprise services, and I'm limiting myself. So I'm using, I'm using a one design style to write an application, to write a, a class that is a service that is multi-channel. That's what I'm doing here, right? We can use it as, this was the first thing, we can use it as, as, as a web service. We can also use it as something else. So uh, here I'm going to say, fine, uh, this has a web service binding attribute. And what did I hit now? A little, my hands are already a little confused. So I think it started to help. My, my, my help figure. I think it was, it, was, it was looking for some action. It's waiting for the notepad. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is, my disk is spinning. See? And I don't need, I need that. Oh, I don't need, don't even need, need that because what I need to reference here, which I, which I haven't referenced yet, is the matching assembly, system, dot web dot service. And since I'm doing that already, let's go and grab um, <coughs> that and system dot runtime dot remoting, and let's grab system dot runtime service serialization, and let's grab system dot service model, and let's grab system dot messaging. Sounds like a reasonable selection of assemblies. Random. <laughs> it's not quite random. There's a little bit. There's a little bit of a. I need a web service binding. The web service binding gets a name, and the name the name is uh, I address manager. It's not <coughs> stupid that I have to provide the name, but I actually have to. And the namespace is from our service metadata, the address manager namespace URI. So here we have a web service binding. Having the web service binding, I can now say web method on this. And turns out now we have a method. With a method with a binding. It still says, whoa, your service is using tepuri.org as its namespace because that's the namespace for the service declaration. So here's my service description. Here's my types. It references, as you can see, it references actually outside schema declarations now, ASP.NET. And here's my service declaration. My binding actually. Uh, sits in the second whistle that we can get using whistle is whistle one. So here's my abstract declaration. Here's my binding in with my binding uh, in my binding with my binding declarations. Right, that's my I address manager. And uh, but the service implementation itself doesn't have a namespace you write. Uh, yet, so I have to declare that yet, and that's what I'm doing on the service itself. So here, but I don't really, really have to worry about the, the web methods. So let's say that's a web service. And 
and then I switch this to low. So, that's my result. again, and now it should come out, actually, I want to go to the help page. Here. Now it comes out clean, wonderful, great. We have a wonderful web service. I could invoke this wonderful <coughs> lesson number one. You don't need to derive from the web service class. Right? You only need you only really need to derive from the web service class if you need to get at special things like the session, like HTTP context. Stuff that you should try to avoid to use anyways, because it's going to make you less compatible with other stacks, including Indigo. So try avoiding getting at the getting at the message. <coughs> that's that's one way to do this. You could also do since we're now using an interface, of course, there's limitless capabilities because you can simply write a plain old class and then easily front it with other implementations, as you will see. I'll, I'll do that for enterprise services. Okay, even though. Using this trick, even though it's scary, you can actually write a service component. No joke, you can write an out of process service component. You can simply put an ASMX file uh, into your web app, which will call across the process boundary the service component as the web services implementation. That works. Um, I've been stunned to see it work, but it does work. Okay, so. Here we have a web service implemented. Now, how hard, it is, how hard is it to expose this as a remoting class? Not at all, just add config. But that's all you need to, that's all you need to do. So in my address manager, <clears throat> let's go and add something as another class. And that class is called the address manager runtime. The address manager runtime is going to get um, two methods. That's easy enough. That's easy enough. Okay. In start stop, I could now go and uh, with the at my choosing go for instance and say uh, channel manager app ah, see it doesn't go quite as far using system dot runtime dot remoting dot channels dot Oh, there's the IPC channel, look at that. Channel services, of course. Channel services at register channel C. That's me in the old world. New TCP channel listening to port um, 808. So listening, I'm registering new channel. And uh, with the remoting configuration, but actually we're going to add an HTTP channel because it's easier to see. Okay, and with remoting configuration, which is right here, I'm going to add, I'm going to register a well-known service type. Let's let's do that. Uh, which sits on which of which type of is address manager impl and where the URI is ADR and where the well known object mode is sync call. Sounds reasonable? It's okay. Let's stop. Unregister an object. 
We can't? Huh? No, 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 I want to, okay, I have to kill the channel in that case, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the channel to stop it. So unregister the channel, that works, okay? So what I need to do is I need to take this puppy and uh, it, exactly put it in this little variable. So I'm going to introduce a local variable here, um, okay? And that puppy is actually going to be a class. Well, that's, it's a little too smart for its own good. <laughs> Sorry for all the confusion. It was meant to be just a puppy. <laughs> so, that channel is going to be created. Here, fine. See, now that's that's a lot better. And stop. I just unregistered the channel that I had. Wonderful. And uh, since since the environment that we're going to be in, uh, this this is really a per application thing that I'm doing, right? This is a per runtime. It's a runtime thing. So I'm going to make all this stuff static. Huh? That's a problem if you're coding in front of so many smart people. That's the runtime. It should not be the definition. You define it twice. Ah, yeah. ah, see, you saved me from being an idiot. <laughs> I love you all. All right, so that's start and stop. Now with that, it's a remoting channel, right? Do we have to prove it? Well, first of all, first of all, I create this runtime class for a specific purpose. And the specific, specific purpose being this being hosted in enterprise services, this being hosted in a Windows NT service, and this being hosted in a console app. So I want to abstract, that's an abstraction of runtime behavior of stopping and starting, the stopping and starting the service. Okay? So here we are.